My friends, do you want to take your mix from this to this? Actually, I'm just messing with you guys. This isn't one of those kind of videos at all. Sometimes you just gotta make fun of yourself, right? But there are a couple things I actually do want to focus on in this episode. We're gonna get into that now. As audio engineers, we already have enough on our plate without having things that discourage us from going any further. Like, this is not an easy job or profession and there's so much doubt always going on in our minds based on like how much we're making critiques of our work and our art. You guys know what I mean? But there are some things that we don't need to worry about and we do anyways. Well, by the end of this video, my friends, you'll know the top five things you don't need to worry about when you're trying to become a better audio engineer. Number one, expensive preamps. So right now I'm going to play three preamps back to back and you're gonna tell me which is the least expensive and which is the most expensive. Sound like a fun game to play? All right, let's go for it. Now, do you have it in your mind? Hold that thought until the end of this segment. And this is a weird one coming from a guy that has over $10,000 worth of preamps sitting in my studio in Burbank right now as we speak. Why don't you just give them the address and a key while you're at it? <laughs> Ignore him. But after getting all this stuff, I just realized it doesn't matter that much, man. If you want to buy one nice preamp that has an ironclad reputation, kind of like SSL, Neve, API, then cool, go with that. But there are preamps and interfaces that cost next to nothing that sound absolutely awesome. The Universal Audio Volt, the Audient ID series, um, those new SSL interfaces, the two pluses or whatever. And all of those interfaces have those preamps built in and they're great on your source material and will work for just about any production, seriously. So we're gonna take a second and listen back to these preamps that range everywhere from 200 bucks for the whole interface to 11 to $1,200 for just a single preamp channel. And in a mix, I'm just being honest, there's no way you would be able to tell the difference in those. Just a lot of time spent on spending money instead of creating a better song. And that's what we should be focusing on in the first place. But since we did that, let's get into our second subject now, expensive cables. This is another one of those things that just does not matter from brand to brand. I haven't done a video comparing cables of the same length to each other, but I have done a video in the past that was comparing different length cables of the same brand. And that was with Rudy Ayub. That was a really funny video. You should check it out. And what I learned is that the length is what makes the difference. It has nothing to do with what brand of cable you're using. As long as they're the same length and have like neutral connectors or whatever, you're gonna be good to go. One thing I will say about different cables though, when you're worried about the brand of the same length cable, it more just comes down to the build quality, the materials that are being used to make the cable, that sort of thing. But the sound, I just, yeah, sorry, I can't vouch for that one. So just realize it's not gonna have any effect on the frequency response as long as it's properly shielded. So in other words, I'd rather use an MXR six foot cable than an 18 foot long Mogami cable. And that's a $70 price difference just on a cable. Imagine going up to Andy Sneap and being like, dude, I love the guitar tone you got on Disarm the Descent by Killswitch. So what type of gold tip connector did you use for that instrument cable? Sounds kind of silly when you say it out loud, right? And I'll say the shorter the cable, the less chance of high frequency loss, resulting in extra sub frequency information. And that's something I actually need for myself. Hit that subscribe button, notification bell, and like button if you're loving the content. My transition game is still crazy. And these are the topics that have to do with spending money. Let's go into something that has a little bit more to do with your morals in the next topic. Avoiding production tools. This is an argument that I have pretty often with producers, mixers, and songwriters, etc. And there's a lot of hate on using production tools like sample packs in music. The only place it's really widely accepted is hip hop, pop music, and I think there's a reason for that. Those genres typically have one artist that has to come up with ideas that sound like it took a team of people to make. Makes sense, right? But if you're in rock, metal, punk, etc., you're already expected to have a team of people helping you write, which is your band. So people don't really accept the idea of using these things sometimes, even on the production end of it. The thing is, we've kind of moved away from that mindset though, and while most casual listeners 
don't realize that we often have one person in a band that's composing the entire track or at least the bones, especially in heavier music, there's still a bit of a stigma for those artists to not ask for outside help. You know, like when you look at a credit list for a rap song and you just see like there's like 10 different people that it took to write one song. Well, no one wants to do that when they're looking up uh, their favorite band and see that it took so many people to make it happen. And this sort of puts a crutch on us to not use loops, uh, sample packs, MIDI groove packs, all the things that would make it really easy for us to get our song going, you know, especially when we're stuck on something. But in reality, all these tools are just meant to be there to help you spark an idea. When I did my Bring Me The Horizon style song, I have to say, I think it would have been kind of whack if I didn't use any samples to get the song going, because the whole beginning of that was just from the JST Chaos Pack. I like pulled it in, dragged and dropped it, and then I was able to start writing guitar underneath and everything. It just gave me a basis to go off of. Let me show you an example of a sample that sparked an idea for a whole song that wouldn't have existed if it didn't just come from a pack. Amazing production. If it wasn't for that initial idea, the rest of it wouldn't have come to life. And if you're a fan of that production you just heard, make sure to sign up for the JST waiting list for Melodic Spark. You can do that in the description below. And this has me thinking about another production of mine, and that brings me to our next topic. You need hardware to compete. There are tons of mixers that have switched to doing everything in the box or that only know doing everything in the box. It's cost efficient easy to recall, and you can pretty much bring it with you anywhere without having to check a bag. A while back, I did this video of one of our plugins versus a $6,000 vocal chain. Only the OGs are gonna remember that one. It was one of my first videos, and um, it was Howard Benson vocals, and it was against a bunch of stuff. And it was nerve wracking when I did this. I think it was a live feed, and I had some of my favorite mixers in there, uh, and producers, they were like watching and commenting as I was doing. I'm just like sitting there like, don't mess up, don't mess up. <laughs> but what was interesting about that test is when I originally had done it, we did a blind poll and most of the people selected the plugin. And then when we did it again, it was just really interesting seeing how we got to that point. And we're talking about some serious hardware. You know, we had an SSL Fusion, an 1176, a Roland Space Echo, SPX90, trying to think what else. There was one other thing in there, but regardless, you played them back to back and they both sounded great. They weren't the same, but they sounded awesome in their own right. Let's take a listen to how those sounded AB right now. And that, my friends, was enough for me to stop worrying about hardware so much. Once you get EQ and compression down, you can do anything in the box or with hardware. It doesn't make a difference. Those two things are your building blocks of all mixes. And a lot of people come to my studio, not gonna say where that is again, <laughs> um, and they really are intimidated by all the gear that they see around. I have like a whole rack of SSL EQs and compressors and all this stuff, but in reality, I don't need any of that stuff to make a mix sound good. It's just nice to be able to do that during the tracking phase, if I'm gonna be honest. All you need to make a mix slap is those ears ears. And let's get into the next topic, certifications. So I'm about to put somebody on blast. I'm gonna show you guys a mix that my friend that went to Full Sail did, and he asked me for a mix crit, and we're gonna compare it to Joey's new mix of Attack Attack. <laughs> nah, man, I wouldn't do you dirty like that. I'm just messing with you. Like, come on, dude. But yeah, when I talk about certifications, I'm talking DAW certifications, um, degrees from music schools. Once again, I doubt anyone walks up to Tony Maserati and asks him if he's Pro Tools certified. There's a wealth of information online to learn more about DAWs, techniques, gear, etc. 
this channel included. And I'm not gonna say there's no benefit to going to audio schools because one of the biggest additions to going to school is being around other like-minded people with the same goals. Networking is everything in these situations. But if you have the social skills needed to do that without school, I do kind of think it's a waste of money unless the job you're aiming for specifically requires it, like broadcasting or television or something like that. But most audio engineers I know learned it all without having to go to full sale or take classes on a DAW, just being real. So don't feel like this is holding you back from making it in the audio world. And this is all facts, so don't fall back from the drawbacks. Now let's repeat this one more time because I live for the callbacks. We went over expensive preamps, avoiding production tools, expensive cables, hardware versus plugins, and certifications. Stop letting things that don't matter get in your head and cause you to doubt yourself. Have you let any of these topics hold you back? Have you found a way to push through regardless of not having the best tools at your disposal? Leave it in the comments below and I'll chat with you fine people like I always do. If you're an engineer on the come up, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. You only have to do it one time and tap that bell for notifications. So when a video drops, you know the location. Till next time, my friends, later.